thank you for coming today. We hope to see you again. And with that, I will turn it over to R.C. Marlin. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. As she said, my name is R.C. Marlin. I was born Rosalie Carolyn Marlin, so I just use my initials. You can call me R.C. or Rosalie, whichever you prefer. I live in Salem. I've been here for 17 years now and have written eight books in that time. Well, I was going to say seven and a half because one is not available right now. It's the, the one you were talking about. Unbeknownst the Unbeknownst Two. Yes. It's science fiction and I wanted to write something different and I have taken it off the market. <laughs> anyway, so today is uh, part of the celebration of the birthday of Oregon. So it's uh, only appropriate that I talk about my historical fiction, two books about Oregon that I have written, Grist and Unbeknownst. Grist takes place in 1835 to 1854. It's before the wagon trains, I see. You were look, thinking in your head, you know, <laughs> what was happening in 1835? <laughs> and Unbeknownst takes place in 1845 to 1881. They overlap a bit. And, uh, but there's different characters in each one. I've written about over 30 historical people. And I, behind the title pages, you can find a list of those people if you would like to see who is in the book. At the top is the main characters, and then anyone who is historically uh, known is listed below with a little explanation who they are. In both of them, it's the same way. The main characters are different in each one. However, in Grist, it appears there's more people here in this one. In Grist and this one, I do have one fictional character, or one fictional family to make a story that will really pull you through the book, even though I'm using real events to connect them all. I made up a family in each one of them. If that family is in the scene, then it is my, my imagination working. So I'll talk first about Grist. Um, this talk today, I, I chose that I would I wanted to speak about people or events that really happened, that really existed, that fascinated me, hoping that it would fascinate my readers as well. And I wanted to choose things that I thought other people may not know about. So because of that, I'm going to ask you from time to time today to raise your hands and let me know, did you know about that? <laughs> so help me out there. Don't be shy, OK? I'm just curious, but anyway. So my main character in Grist, I met her at Mission Mill over, they have a new name now, um, Willamette Heritage Center at the Mill. I, most people still call it Mission Mill. It was a young girl, a um, high school girl that was dressed up in 18th century costume because they were having an event that young high schoolers were supposed to pick a historical character, dress up like that person, and then as the visitors came in, talk about that person. So I asked this young girl, who are you? She said, I'm Margaret Jewett Bailey, the first author in the Northwest. How many people have heard about Margaret Jewett Bailey? Only through your book. <laughs> Not before then. OK. Did anybody else raise their hand? No. Yeah, it's amazing. Well, not too amazing. Uh, she was not only the first uh, author of a book. She called it a novel, but it was an autobiography. Historians refer to it as autobi um, an autobiography. It's called The Grains. Does that make sense? The grains come first, and then you get grist, grist yeah. when you go to the grist mill. The Grains um, was published in 1854. That same year, they were all destroyed. So not many people know about her. That should pose a question in your face. You should say, well, how can you hold that book if it's been destroyed? <laughs> Let me answer that. I'm going to read from a publication of the Marion County Historical Society. This article was written in 1959. And uh, 
I will explain about her books a bit. It's written by O.W. Frost. And the title is Margaret Jewett Bailey, Oregon Pioneer Author. Margaret Jewett Bailey, for 20 years a resident within what is now Marion County, was a truly amazing woman. She was the first white women, woman to settle on a French prairie farm, the first local poet to be published in Oregon, and the author of the first autobiography published in the Northwest. 25 years old and as yet unmarried, she sailed to Oregon in 1837. She was, while in Oregon, she was twice married, twice divorced. She was earnest, devout, captious, and hypersensitive. What he's trying to say is she was hard to get along with. <laughs> <laughs> when I read The Grains the first time, I thought, oh, I can't write about this woman. I don't like her at all. <laughs> I put it down and kept my research going, and then I read it a second time, and I thought, wow, she's a lot like me in some ways. <laughs> By the third reading, I was reading between the lines and saw that she didn't say everything about herself, but it's in my book. Anyway, O. W. Frost goes on to explain why we can have her book today, and I'll paraphrase this. In 1935, a man, Albert Powers, was researching literature of the 1800s in Oregon so he could write his own book, and he came across a review of the grains. It was a hostile review, but he couldn't find the book. So he published his book, and he made that comment in his book that this book I couldn't find, but here's the review. Then nine years after that, another man was going through our Oregon State Library and found half of the book. She had published in two volumes. He found volume two. And so he wrote an article and let people know that I have volume two of Margaret Jewett Bailey's book, The Grains. Anyone know where the other half is? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Another passage of years, I can't remember, oh, 18, uh, 19, 19, 1959, um, and um, someone in the East Coast discovers volume one in Yale University Library. Now we have volume one and volume two, but volume one wasn't complete. The back of it, the last chapter was gone. And so I picture that it was, the cover's gone, it's kind of have singed ed edges. And, but the title page of that last chapter was, was still on the book. And it was called Sally Soul. Well, that gave them an opening. Many years went by, but in 1985, OSU decides to republish Margaret Jewett Bailey's book, The Grains. They have volume one and volume two, and they hire, hire two people, Evelyn Leisher and Robert J. Frank, to work on reproducing her book. And they found an article published in a paper in the East Coast newspapers that was called Sally Soul. Margaret was a writer, without a doubt. She was always writing journals. In fact, this book is mainly her journals. And she was writing short stories about, about Oregon and sending them back east. Everyone was interested. She came here in 1837, and so it was very early, but people were getting a lot of interest up for this western place and wanted to come. It turns out that uh, Sally Soul was published in an article in a newspaper, and so they could reproduce it and have the com book complete. Like I said, um, I wanted to let you know what fascinated me and events that I felt were unusual and maybe people wouldn't know it about, and Sally Soul grabbed my attention too. It turns out she was a Mati. Mati stands for half-breed. We can now call them Mati. They had a white father and a Native, Ameri a Native American mother. 
She was a Métis at the Methodist Mission, and that's why Margaret wrote about her. They only had children that came to the Methodist Mission when they opened it, because in 1830, diseases killed so many of the Native Americans throughout this Oregon and the Northwest that there weren't many to come to a mission. But the children who came were all Mati because the tribes weren't too happy with that mixed children. And a lot of them were orphans, of course. Well, that was the second person <coughs> in my book then, that second main character, this Sally Soul, but I don't call her Sally Soul. The Methodist missionaries changed all the children's names to Christian names. And I felt if they could change her name once, I could change it back. I have a book on my bookshelf about the Kalapuyan natives, and I, I uh, looked up some words. I chose Sawala as her name. I liked how it sounded. It means sunflower. And when you hear a description of what she looked like, you'll see why I chose that one. In fact, I'd like to read from my book. I will be reading uh, short passages from my books today. And I'm going to read about this little girl. It's chapter four in Grist. Sawala, the Mati, Life Among the Kalapuya Indians in 1836-1837. Like everyone else, Sawala had always called her mother Waka, not knowing at first that it meant slave. Sawala never knew her mother's real name because af soon after Sawala had been born, they both were traded to the Kalapuyan tribe who forbid them to speak anything but the language of the Kalapuyans. During all of Sawala's life, her mother had repeated upon waking, this day I greet you and remind you that I'm a slave because you came from my body with hair the color of the sun. My people did not like this and traded me to the Kalapuyans. Now we are forever slaves. Let me interrupt. How many people knew that the, the Nat Native Americans in all of the Northwest had slaves? Yes, all of the different, different peoples. Good, we have two people that knew that. Both Sawala and Waka had the flattened brows of their people, the Chinook tribe. Waka carried her high and flattened forehead with pride for her daughter, who could remember no other life except her time among the Kalapuyan children, who taunted her for her blonde hair, blue eyes, and flattened forehead. Her brow was a burden. But Sawala was a gentle slow soul and always wanted to please. She worked hard with and with pleasure. She liked her life. She enjoyed gathering the blackberries, elderberries, huckleberries, and salmonberries when those seasons came. She picked hazelnuts and acorns in the late summer and fall. She liked the travels to different places to search for berries and nuts as well as the trips to catch salmon. But her favorite time was the harvest of the camas that grew in the rain shadow climate on the savanna. This morning dawned with a drizzle. Soala rose and braided her hair. Even in a braid, it fell past her waist. She remembered being in this camas fields weeks ago when they had removed all the poison camas and when she had slept with a man called Bailey. She donned her deerskin with the black tail draped over her shoulder. She, she secured the skin around her body with a strip of rawhide and slipped out from under a tree. Away from the others who still slept, she lifted her face to the falling rain, enjoying the coolness, and then she circled around camp to greet the birds. She returned after a few minutes. Upon seeing her, Watka turned to say the usual, this day of soft falling water, I greet you to remind you that I am a slave because you came from my body and she finished the recitation as she tied her fur to her waist. So Sawala returned the greeting as always. Forgive my birth, Watka. I tried this day to make it up to you. Sawala and Watka walked with a group of six other women in cone-shaped hats made from woven grasses to a field where the camas had been dropped their violet blue petals. None of the noble women came to the harvest, only the commoners and slaves. One of the commoners was designated the leader. She was called Trupka. The plant waste to give us food, dig with the speed of a diving eagle, Watka told her daughter. The slaves with fewer bulbs are struck by the leader. I know, said Sawala. 
What they both accumulated went to Watka's quota because Sawala was still considered a child. On her knees, Sawala reached into their basket to get her digging stick made from deer antlers. Some were made from wood and broke easily. Her noble family had given her this prize too because she always dug many bulbs. It came in two parts, a long and curved digging stick with a hole at one end for the handle, making a T-shaped imp implement when inserted. Clutching the antler handle, she thrust the long carved point down into the soil along the stem of the plant and twisted it to loosen the small egg-shaped white bulbs. With a flip of her wrist, the bulbs were thrust up and out of the soil. Bulbs were chosen for size. The smaller ones returned to the hole to grow another season. Watka and Swala dropped their harvest bulbs into the burden basket that they had woven from the thin green branches. I have pictures throughout the books. That's a burden basket. They worked all morning gathering bulbs. While they worked, Sawala talked. Listen to the life in the sky, the one who has the breast the color of blood. She stopped her digging a moment and removed her hat. But like always in Oregon, the sun had come out and the rain had left. She shaded her eyes from the sunlight and she saw the bird. Look, he sits at the top of the tree, close to us, and he sings like my heart feels. Not wanting to take too much time looking at the robins, she donned her hat and returned her gaze downward to jab the antler point into the soil again. And she stopped her words, working quietly, and watched her mother move away. Watka began to work her way between the other woman, women further and farther from her daughter. Swala glanced at her mother and saw the familiar look of torment in her face. At these times, the girl surmised that her mother dwelled on memories of her life before coming as becoming a slave. Swala accepted her mother's need for quiet and watched. Swala saw moisture glistening on the backs of all the women. The day was getting hot. But after a while, Waka moved back to Swala's side and the girl continued her cheerful chatter. Watka, did you see the black noisy ones soar from the cedar tree, cedar tree? I think there were more than my fingers and toes. Oh, and look at the size of this camas root. I have never seen one this large. It's like the egg of the ones who float on water. Swala held up a bulb that looked like a duck egg for her mother to see. Their basket filled quickly. Let's go together. Our basket is heavy. You take one side, Waka said. And they proceeded to the area where older women were beating boiled bulbs in the shade. Boiling rendered them soft, and the women pounded them until sticky and dough-like. Then the bulb could be shaped into rounds of 10 by 3 inch cakes. During the day, dozens of cakes were carried one by one to a pit to wait to be baked. All right, that's enough of that. So the third character in this book, uh, the main character, is Margaret's hug husband. Dr. William Bailey. He was an Englishman. He had been trained as a surgeon in England, and he came by ship in 1835 to California. Margaret came in 1837 to Oregon. People who came during that time, most of them came by ship instead of walking. If wagon trains didn't start arriving until 1842-43. So I'd like to read a little bit about him. Did anyone catch I mentioned his name? <laughs> well, he's in chapter one. So I was reading chapter four. So it gave you a little hint about what happened. But I won't be reading about that today. This is chapter one, William, fur trapping trip to Oregon country. When I read about this event, I said, oh, I have to put this one in my book. I t real events that happened that ca captured my attention. I looked for them in other sources because I made a little rule to myself. I would need to find them at least two places to put them into my book because I found contradictions a lot in my research where things were told differently by different people or in different sources. Okay, fur trapping trip to Oregon country in 1835. Taking a deep breath of the crisp air, William J. Bailey gazed around, filling himself with the beauty of the Siskiyou Mountains. But he failed to see the white watching eyes. 
He had fallen behind the pace of seven other trappers, and with none of his party near enough to share his exhilaration, he leaned over the head of, neck of his horse and said, all of this bloody beauty, nothing like New York City. In the past couple of weeks, he had, a, had been amazed by the flora of the West and had gathered leaves and needles samples from the trees. At the end of this trip, he would learn that he had gathered samples of the Coast Douglas fir, weeping spruce, Pacific yew, and blue oak. Grabbing his canteen and drinking, Bailey looked into the distance and drank in the view as well. Wisps of clouds below him floated and tangled on the tops of conifers. Several months prior in San Francisco, Bailey had sat with these same seven men while they planned this 500-mile trapping expedition on the Siskiyou Trail, going from the Central Valley of California to the Willamette Valley of Oregon Country. Following the foothills used by hundreds of years by native tribes, they rode a route that afforded the shortest trip, though not the safest. A couple of the men were experienced trappers and had assured Bailey and the others that they could avoid confrontation with the natives. Ambling along, Bailey's thoughts flew out of his head faster than the little birds he saw darting from the trees. Never thought I'd find a place like this. Huh, I never thought, never thought I would enjoy eating bear. Again, he took a deep breath and returned the canteen to his saddlebag. Tin clanked against steel, canteen against Colt revolver. He smiled to himself, pleased to know he had the best gun in the bunch. Yet he murmured aloud, it might give me six shots without reloading, but I need to learn how to shoot something. Most of this group had single shot guns or rifles like the hall breaching rifle. Daily, Bailey dug in his heels and his horse trotted up to the last pack horse which was stacked with snares, traps, furs like from beaver, otter, a lynx, and a black bear. The furs were not the best at this time of year, but they needed to practice and they needed to eat. So I have a picture of different furs that I took in the um, Shampui State Park. Shampui said one evening that I could rearrange anything I wanted in the park and that's how I got my cover <laughs> as well. So they, they have a great museum up there. All right, back to this. Riding at the head, the leader, John Turner, stopped. Turning in his saddle, he shouted, after coming out of the Siskiyous, we still have a ways to go to the Rogue River. At the point of rocks is where we'll stop to camp. They stood in the open grassy area of the Siskiyou Mountains about 4,000 feet high. In the distance, they could see a snow-covered peak. High above, an eagle careened in the wind. We're almost to Oregon country. Turner called out, but don't rush because it's a steep trail down from this mountain and we ain't stop until we hit bottom, bottom. Like always, we need to set traps for the sun goes down tonight. Descending, Bailey listened to the clop of hooves, the creak of leather from men rocking to and fro in their saddles. He heard the songs of birds, enjoyed the wind whispering past his ears and gazed at the endless growth of conifers growing to the clouds and crowding the hills. In his calm solitude, he didn't hear the forebod foreboding murmurs. Unseen men watched and sent word across the miles. More than 100 Indians headed toward the Rogue River, ready to set a trap for these, these eight men after sunrise. Once at their campsite, the fur trappers worked quickly, going through the routine they had followed every evening for the last fortnight above the point plains of California. Except for the cook, each man took a metal trap or two and set off to the woods or along a river bank. Within 30 minutes, they started to re-enter the camp with their arms full of firewood. Where's Bailey? Turner asked as Bailey appeared in the clearing. Oh, there you are. Take the first turn on watch. Go up that hill over yonder. George will bring you some food when he relieves you. George Kirby Gay and Bailey had become friends. Jesting, Bailey complained, he'll probably eat most of my portion before I even see it. Besides, Gay is scared of the dark. Why not send Woodward with him? John Woodward, one of the more experienced trappers, looked up at the mention of his name and grinned a mile wide. Bailey continued to taunt. Woodward would guard my food and hold Gay's hand. The men had started laying down their bedrolls but stopped to look at Gay. First one chuckled and soon others were howling in laughter. William, William you no good dirty skunk of a friend, George Gay hollered as he threw his tin plate 
into Bailey's chest. Then he flung his fork and dove into Bailey's legs. They rolled in the dirt, hitting and laughing. John Turner didn't like what he saw. He pulled Bailey off gay. I told you to get on guard duty. When I give an order, you gotta do it. Turner was fun-loving like the rest of the men, so his men wondered what was bothering him. Bailey brushed off his pants and pick up, picked up his hat. Yes, sir, I need to get my gun. He took his bedroll and furling the blanket open, threw it around his shoulders before slipping his gun and a worn flask out of his saddlebag. Turner never missed a thing. Damn it, Bailey, no spirits on guard duty. William Bailey nodded and put it back. Damn liquor, even when I know better, it calls me. He ambled out of camp and up the hill while he tucked his colt down in his hip pocket. He had decided against buying a holster, not wanting to look like a gunslinger and invite trouble. Although the last glow from the sun had disappeared hours ago, he walked along among the shadows. A waxing gibbous moon lit his way. At the top of the hill, he found a boulder surrounded by sword ferns and climbed on top for a better view. Turning to fear full, peer full circle, he saw none of the natives who saw him. An hour passed and then another. The chill of the night went to his bones and he felt the ice cold boulder sapping the warmth from his body. He sat on his blanket with it draped over his legs and still he shivered. He fought his sleepiness, although from time to time he nodded off. The unseen native men remained alert. While Bailey dozed, a great horn owl swooped above his head and made no sound in the silent flap of his wings. The Indians saw the bird. A subtle pleasure rippled across their faces as their eyes met. They acknowledged the honor of sharing the night with this regal one. Like the bird, they expected a kill. I think I'm going to stop there before the blood starts. Bailey will get a tomahawk wound from his ear across uh, his, his um, jawbone and that he will be, for life, have this horrible scar that he will grow beards and mustaches to cover it. He was a good looking man and so he didn't want to look poorly. All right, so um, that was 1835. By the way, do just speak out if you have questions, it's fine. He had asked what was the approximate date of that scene. That John Turner was a historical character. Yes, yes. And he was local as well. Yes, he was, yes. And I, I, Yes, and I tell in my book what happens to him after this and how he dies. Did he take care of the cattle? Yes, the he, he asked if uh, John Turner lived in this area and, could, and took care of the cattle for the Methodist mission, and he did. He did, yes. Yes. Squatter's claim over in Polk County. That's correct. That's you've, your, you've got, he um, asked. <laughs> So to recap what he said is he was talking about John Turner, the man I had just read about, and he was completely correct. He knows well, his history. Yes. At this time that I'm reading about, yes. there's when Margaret arrives, there was only two hundred people in this area. So you're right. That everybody knew everybody. And uh, there were fur trappers here that had their Native American wives and then the missionary people started to come, like Margaret, and these trappers that were coming up. Could that family have been involved with Turner, Oregon? Uh, yes, they could have, but I don't know. If he asked if the John Turner's family was involved with yeah. Turner, Oregon. Exactly not named after him. And uh, the other man who was knowledgeable on Turner, because his Turner owned po property in Polk County, and he said that his family bought that property eventually. Yeah, Yes. That your family bought that? What's that? What, your family bought it in the late 40s? No. His, um, his, his property was bought by a family called Phillips. John mm -hmm. Phillips and his family walked across the prairie there. They originally came from England in the 1830s, but they came 
came over and um, he, was, he was married to a native woman. Yes, I talk about that in the book. He had died. Yes, After I talk died, about that in the book. He was pretty desolate. He sold his um, squatter's rights to the plane Yes, plane there. he was talking. He's, you know, they can't hear in the streaming, and that's why I'm trying okay. to repeat what you're saying. They can't hear you speak. So he was telling about John Turner had married a Native American. Yes, I talk about that. I, um, and it tells about his death yeah. as well. It so takes him through his life. The cabin that they bought from Mr. Turner burned down like the first winter. So they had to build another one. And in 1849, Mr. Phillips went down to the California Gold Rush. He came back, and the family history doesn't really talk about how much gold he got there, but he did build the house. It was finished in 1852. So he's, it's, he's still, it's still on the property. He's telling how his family came about uh, the, the property that John Turner owned and that the cabin had, the original cabin had burned down. Yep. And they rebuilt it. Well, my brother in law bought the property from his descendants. Yes. It will remain a section of land. Have you know. read my book yet? Not yet. You will enjoy in reading yep. about what happened with but I'll let you your family. That. I just yes. Have direct relations to that part. So, um, Let's see, where was I? All right, I'm going to move on to Unbeknownst now. Um, the main characters in the Unbeknownst are Robert Newell and Joseph Meek and Albert Bayless. Most people, I see people nodding their heads, know, know uh, Robert Newell. He would like to be called Doc Newell. And most of us know because of the Newell museum, a Newell House Museum up in Shampooey. He built that house with others and it is the original house and it still remains today. He was lucky when the flood of 1861 came through. It took his cabin that he had been living in before he built the house and his house remained. I tell about that flood in this book Unbeknownst as well. So. Joseph Meek, a lot of people know about too, usually referred to as Joe Meek. He was the first sheriff in Oregon country and the first uh, U.S. Marshal as well. The two of them were fort fur trappers together. They met before when they first started fur trapping on the east and um, they were as different as could be. Robert Newell was an educated, college educated man and Joe, Joe Meek is illiter was illiterate until Robert taught him how to read and write. But they both liked telling stories. And Joe Meek told tall tales and bear stories about his encounters with the pear bears. I have a lot of them in this book. And Robert Newell, or Doc Newell as he was known, always carried two books with him while they were fur trapping, a Bible and a book of Shakespeare. And over the campfires, meant those two would tell stories, whether Joe Meek read from the Bible, I mean, read, uh, told his tall tales, or Doc told um, stories of Shakespeare. They kept the men entertained. And they finally tired of their fur trapping because the furs were getting depleted. They decided to come to Oregon together and settle down and have a family fi finally. And uh, uh, they, they led a group to this area. I, um, I forgot where I was going. <laughs> well, I'm going to read on page 43. Oh, I remember. The, um, this is a celebration of the birthday of Oregon. And in this book, I have a scene that really happened. It was a meeting at Fort Vancouver of course, it's what Vancouver is today. Is the fort is still there as a museum. But the Hudson's Bay Company was in the fort at that time. So if, if the people of the area wanted to have a meeting, they usually ask if they could meet at the fort. And John McLaughlin, who was the chief factor of the fort, usually uh, agreed to that. The, um, um, they're going to be coming to this meeting from Shampooey. This is when Doc was living in a cabin there. And uh, Margaret Jewett Bailey is with him. Now, she's not the ma a main character in this book. 
But I do continue her story in this book, and you will read about the destruction of her books. And uh, so they're, they're going to go by wagon. It's only about 20 miles that they have to travel up to the fort. And Doc Newell's going to take a couple of his boys that he wants to learn about the politics in the area. And Margaret has a young girl with her that she was watching for her family. It's a very famous family, the Holmes family. The little girl is Mary Jane Holmes. The Holmes family is the first black family to win a court case against their white slave owner. And I talk about that in this book as well. So we have them in the wagon, two horses, and they arrive at the fort. As soon as they arrived, they left their horses to be brushed down and fed in the fort's livery stables. Doc went to the meeting. Margaret took little Mary, Mary Jane to stay with a woman friend at the fort before she and the children headed to the meeting. The room was full. After Doc had asked some people to make space on the bench for Margaret and the children, he went up front. As the representative of the Oregon Legislative Committee and the Speaker of the Assembly, and he sat down next to Joe Meek. Lieutenant William Peel and Captain H.W. Park were representing the British Crown and sat at the same table with them. The audience was a mix of men and women settlers, the residents of the fort, and people from the tribes. All the seats in the room were filled and the men stood, and men stood too deep against the walls. The chairman slammed the gavel against the table with a bang, silencing the talk. The chief factor has asked me to open the meeting. He will join us later. I want to welcome our distinguished guests, Lieutenant Peel of the British Navy and Captain Park from the Royal Ma Marines. The lieutenant stood and began. Thank you. It is an honor to be here, and I want to thank all who are attending tonight. Since receiving my orders to come, it has taken me over a year to arrive. Most of us know the difficulty one faces to make this trip, whether by land or sea. I started on the flagship Collingwood and changed to the ship Cormorant in Valparaiso, Chile. Finally, I took the frigate America, and after docking in Puget Sound, I got on a horse and rode here to the Columbia River. My orders were to allay any fears you, you citizens may have. As you can hear by the description of my trip, Britain's Navy and Army are willing to go to great distances to protect you. He stopped to look at his notes. Hearing his words, people frowned and whispered, sending ripples of murmurs around the room. When he looked up, the disgruntled voices faded. And seemingly unaware of this negative reaction, the speaker continued. As everyone knows, the Hudson's Bay Company has been here representing the British Crown in North America since the English Royal Charter of 1670. That's over 180 years. We have provided the opportunity for each of you to settle here and make your homes with the help of the Hudson Bay Company, which was the only place to provide you with the supplies needed to survive. You are welcome, but it is our place to emphasize that this is a British and he was interrupted. People stood, they shouted, they raised their arms, shook their fists, they complained. The gavel banged over and over. Once the crowd calmed, the lieutenant seemed to have nothing more to say. He mumbled and stumbled through some comment about the situation needing resolution. No one was interested, and the people in the audience chattered among themselves. One woman said, I hear that Peel's only 19 years old. Who does he think he is to tell us anything? Someone else answered, he's the son of the prime minister, but that doesn't impress me. A man asked, did you see that battleship that was in the Columbia last week? I heard that McLaughlin was angry and told them to leave. A man agreed, yeah, McLaughlin knows that riles us up. It was flying the British flag. What people had seen was an 18-gun sloop called the Modeste that was commanded by Thomas Beale. McLaughlin had re recommended to that captain that it was wise not to show force and he should shift up to Puget Sound. Not, one, not much went on in the Willamette Valley that people didn't hear about. When Lieutenant Peel sat down, the captain was asked if he had ad anything to add. With a stern face, Captain Park stood and began a rant. 
Mr. Chairman, he said with a slight bow to the chair and then turned to the audience with a raised voice. Great Britain has been here with Hudson's Bay Company longer than any of you. We have made it possible for you to successfully settle by lending tools, seeds, and any supplies. On our books, there exists an enormous unpaid debt. He leaned forward and slammed his fist to the table. How dare you shake your fists at us? With an extended arm pointing to the audience, he shouted, I refer to your debt to the Hudson Bay Company. When our retired fur trappers were lent supplies, they pay back their debt in three years. You, and he spat out his words in a sarcastic tone, of this provisional government shirk from pain. And what does this meager provisional government mean? You have no army, no protection other than us. He stopped, took a deep breath, and pulled on the coattails of his uniform to straighten the jacket. In a firm but normal voice, he addressed the chair. I stand down in disgust. Quickly, Doc raised his voice and said, Mr. Chair, I request to take the floor. After a nod from the chairman and tap of the gavel, Doc began, I am Robert Newell, but you're welcome to call me Doc, or as most people do. I'm here as Speaker of the Assembly to represent the Oregon Legislative Committee and to inform our esteemed visitors that this organization has been in existence since 1843 when we voted on May 2nd of that year to form our provisional government. He paused and took a breath. We knew we were laying the foundations of a great state. Our two years are minuscule compared to the time you mentioned, nearly 200 years. But we have accomplished much for the people who live here. We have been making laws and upholding justice. We have established the first uniform of taxation. The Oregon Legislative Committee consists of nine elected representatives who are looking on land claims, appropriations, military formation, judiciary needs, and redistricting. And districting. We, the people of Oregon, have realized that we need laws and order. We want you to know that we are here to stay as American citizens in America, and it's only a matter of time before that's official. Also, to emphasize our organization and dedication, I want you to know that I am director of the Oregon Printing Association. In just a few months, in February, we'll have a newspaper called The Oregon Spectator. It'll be printed in Oregon City. We are a society, organized and devoted, working together to help each other grow and prosper in all ways. For food and shelter, our people have built and run grist mills and sawmills have warehouses for grain and organized community gatherings to share ideas. For development of our minds, for we are more than fur trappers or passing visitors, I have formed the Oregon Lyceum, a literary and debating society to further literature and scientific pursuits. Doc smiled to relax the discussion and added, however, often in our meetings in the Oregon Lyceum, we end up talking politics. A few people laughed at his humor. The point I'm wanting to make is this. We are not here to gather furs to sell or to accumulate other products to be sent back to Europe. We're here to live. This is our American home. Most of the audience stood to cheer. Applause filled the room. Even with the banging of the gavel, the people continued to clap and shout. Soon they began to chant, Oregon is America, Oregon is America. That is when Doc noticed that John McLaughlin, the chief factor of the Hudson's Bay Company, was standing in the back of the room. Doc leaned to whisper to, to Meek, look who has joined us. How long has he been here? Meek frowned, bobbed his shoulders, shook his head to indicate he didn't know. He turned to the audience and in a loud voice above the crowd's chants, he asked, permission to speak. Sheriff Meek has the floor. As he stood, his chair fell down with a bang. Everyone strained to see what made that loud noise, and the commotion in the room dissipated to complete silence. There stood Joseph Meek, looking more like a beady-eyed bear than a gentleman. He stood six feet two, the size and shape of a grizzly. For the occasion, he had slicked down his almost black hair on the top of his head, but the wild beard and mustache covered his face and was framed by the long, dark hair that fell down his back. Adding to the bear look, he wore a door he wore a dark beaver skin vest, a long-tailed black coat, 
and even his legs looked like an animal's haunches with the rumpled and mud-splattered trousers. All eyes were on Joe Meek, and he smiled. Doc started to pick up the overturned chair, and Joe put his hand on Doc's shoulders. Thank you, Mr. Newell. I can quiet the crowd with my gavel myself. He picked up the chair, and with two fists clutching it, he banged it down on the floor several times. Everyone laughed. He began. Esteemed guests and all here tonight, I've but one item of interest to mention. He looked around the room, hiked up his trousers by the belt at his waist. This here room is crowded, but it barely represents us Americans who came here to live. Most just don't know how crowded it is here in the Willamette Valley. He stopped for emphasis before saying in a raised voice, but I do, and then he shouted, because this year I took a census. And I took this census of our people before the wagon trains of 1845 were here. Of course, it's like counting jackrabbits, but the counters did a good job. He turned and stepped up onto his chair to bellow. There are more than 2,110 Americans living in Oregon. Hats flew into the hair with whoops throughout the room. For many minutes, the din continued with the gavel banging in the background. John McLaughlin slipped out of the room during this time. Doc noticed the smile on the chief actor's face when he made his exit. So that was 1845. Look how involved they were. They knew they were going to be a state. There was a lot of problems going on at that time. This, they, there's problems with the annexation of Texas and the war with Mexico and people are just ignored in Oregon at this time. So those are two of my characters. A third character in Unbeknownst, as I mentioned, is Albert Bayless. And uh, he came by wagon train. He came from the Tennessee, Kentucky area. And he found a wagon train that was coming in uh, Independence, Missouri. It was run by George Luther Boone. We all know the name Boone. This man, George Luther Boone, is the great grandson of Daniel Boone. And his father was the guy who built Boone's Ferry that we all know. So Albert Bayless got on this wagon train that was run by George Luther Boone, and he uh, became the blacksmith at the wagon train. And he became one of the first black pioneers to come to Oregon. In my book, I've written about six different black pioneers because I wanted to honor them. They made a big difference. But Albert Bayless knew how to read and write, so I could find more out about him. Plus, it was just a coincidence, but I live near uh, the Pioneer Cemetery, and he, his grave is there. And I got to go over and see the gravestone that said Albert and Mary Bayless, and oh my goodness, what a moving moment that was for me. The, uh, the black pioneers, um, I think I wrote about six of them, but Albert Bayless, and I had more information than anyone else. Uh, mm, before, I, I don't think I'll read any more. I'll ask questions, but I do have a couple more questions. I want to point out that in my book that I also talk about some things I don't think most people know about. How many of you know about Abernathy Rocks? Ah, good. It's a, it's a good story. It's uh, across from McLaughlin's house in Oregon City, well, before he moved it up the hill, in the original position, there was a brick store, one of the first brick buildings in, and it was owned by Abernathy, who became the, uh, the governor of before we were a state. And he had problems, you know, the monetary, you know, how do we buy things here? We barter, right? Or we exchange things, and so I need a, some flour and, uh, and I am going to have to buy a great big bag of flour, and how do I pay for it? So maybe I will exchange some of the little things that I have sewn as a woman. And there's a difference 
the flower might be worth 20 bucks and what I sewed and give to the Abernathy's store to sell some little purses. So Mr. Abernathy would take out some stones that he kept collected in his drawer, write on a piece of paper that Margaret Jewett Bailey is owed, or the value of my stone is, $10.55 or something like that, and she would drop that into her purse. Everyone walked around with a pocket full of rocks, and on it was written by Mr. Abernathy what the value of those rocks, and it soon became a way of buying things. People use these rocks. The other method that was most people don't know about is beaver coins. How many of you know about beaver coins? Same good three this time, great. Well, before, before um, we became a state, of course, we had, like I said, no American money. But gold was starting to come in because of the, the 1849 gold rush. But the problem with the gold was it was a mixed with dirt, rock particles, and who had a scale to be able to weigh it, even if there was some larger pieces that you could put onto a scale. Just a few places had scales, so people got the idea, and George Luther Boone was one of these people, let's melt down some of this gold and make beaver coins. Well, a lot of people said, well, we don't, can't make money, that's against the law. Well, we're not a state yet. And so they made beaver coins. And as almost a month later, after they had their beaver coins, one was a $5 coin and another was a $10 coin, we became a state, and so they were outlawed very quickly. And uh, there are very few that exist today. I tried to research to find if I could see one. And they said the Secretary of the State should have one saved away. But when I ask Miss um, Brown, <laughs> She was Secretary of the State at that time. She didn't know anything about that. And I, I don't know where one can see a beaver coin anymore. Then that's the end of my discussion. Are there any questions? There are some Are there? I imagine they're very, very, very valuable. Yes. I have no idea what the cost would be, but. Wasn't yeah. before that, wasn't wheat also a big item of barter, wheat or grain? Uh, I, think, I thought it was in one of these two that wheat was a big commodity to, to barter with. Well, he asked the question about we're talking about not having any money to pay for things and you have to barter. Yes, of course your wheat was, was something to barter with, but if you wanted something that cost less, I mean, how would you balance the scale, so to speak, to to, you know, have things work out equally, and that was the reason for Abernathy to make his rocks. But people kept it on their books. They would write it down on a piece of paper, but not everyone could write. So it was, it was just a, a basic problem. Yes, anything, any grain was, was, was a valuable money. So the boom, that same boom as the house at Mission Hill, the ones that involved with the coins and everything. A house at Mission Mill. So the houses that are in the courtyard behind it there. Right, that's a Jason Jason Lee house. Right. And Pastor Boone is the other one. The oh, I wasn't sure what is. I knew yeah. it was a Boone house. Is there really? I don't know. I really don't know if that is or isn't. But it's it's not George Luther Boone's okay. house. All right. George Luther Boone went. Uh, he went to Oregon City after the wagon train. His brothers and father's father lived there, and then they all started dispersing out throughout the state. And George Luther Boone ended up going to the south of Astoria to live. And uh, he loved living on the coast. Is this based on true facts? Yes, yes. Unless that one family, the Bogay family, is in the scene, all of those scenes, that every scene in here except the Bogay family scene are events that I found in my research and I made the Bogay family so I could kind of tie them all together to make a story. 
instead of just making a history book. But it's it's when they use the rocks to eat their little babies' heads. Right, right. Yeah, I have that in in this book too. Yes. I know whether it was true. Oh, oh, yes. She asked the question that the the native the natives all the people in this area they weren't very happy with the white man making babies and so like i said they didn't didn't like having the mati children so they would yes ask the mother if she was going to have a mati child that when it was born to crush the head of the child so it wouldn't live yes i i got that information from a professor at, at uh, OSU a Dr. Bronner, he he gave me uh, doctoral theses that two of them that his students had created, and one of them was on the Mati uh, people of the area, and uh, she documented that over and over in the book. Was the one the baby that wasn't killed that was saved right in your book? Yes, uh, that's one of the bouquets. Was, was that a fictional character? Yes, he, he became. He becomes a bouquet. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yes, I agree. <laughs> One of my other books, I, the first book I wrote, uh, was kind of like a Romeo and Juliet. It was a tragedy. And my brother was so angry with me, he made me promise never to write a tragedy again. <laughs> so I won't. <laughs> So was was there a relationship documented between the baby and that Indian little girl? No. Okay. No. See, yeah, that's the, in the, book with the yeah, oh, but okay. see, it involves the Bulgarians, and so well, no. He was kind of a womanizer. Uh, he was a drunk. He asked a question about Will, Dr. William Bailey. Yes, he was a he was an alcoholic. Yes, yes, he was, and he uh, was a womanizer. Right. I imagine most men were. Um, Margaret Jewett Bailey. One of the reasons that her I believe her books were destroyed, it's my opinion, of course, but after I say it, you'll probably agree. She was uh, a woman before her time. She was an environmentalist, a feminist. She knew she was equal to any man. She was a very intelligent, when you, if you would read her book, and they sell them at the Mission Mill. If you would read her book, you'd see she's a very, very in intelligent person. Because she felt she was equal to any man, she told about her affairs in this book. She had four affairs. Three of them on the East Coast before she got on the ship to come here. And then I think the fourth affair was her undoing. She had an affair with one of the missionaries. And the, the people in this area probably didn't like that. They took offense, I'm sure. And uh, he was Wilson, our Wilson Park, with two L's. So that's, that's, that did, that's what did her in, I think. Any other questions? Our time is, yes. I did in terms of black people in the area. Yes. Uh, there are few. So I wondered, did, uh, did they leave? I, I, was, I was amazed. And she, she, her question was about the black people that were in this area. She made the comment that there were few. Did they leave? Before, before the wagon trains started arriving, there were dozens, maybe two dozen, all right, in the area. And um, you can find, I found references to about six of them that had events as, or things that were happening that I included in my book that really happened to them. Once the wagon trains arrived, the prejudice arrived. Before then, people were people. The people who lived here didn't think anybody was different than anyone. And uh, you know they took wives from the, the Native Americans. They lived in harmony. Uh, the black people were among them at that time. But once, once the wagon trains came, then the prejudice, and I have documented in here some of the things that started happening to those, the black people of the area. Does that answer your question? There were more than I, th I was amazed. There were more than you realized, even though there were laws against them. People just ignored the laws. And like I said, there was even this Holmes family that they won a court case, which is a good demonstration that the black people were treated 
equally with everyone. Other questions? Thank you very much for having me today. I really appreciate it sharing my book.